there's something I thought positively Shakespearean about the, the power struggles that surround this child as she's growing up. And that, in a sense, must be a, a testament to the strength of Victoria's character, the fact that she withstands this incredible buffeting where her own mother will portray her as weak-minded in order to exercise more power over her or, uh, or manipulate how she's perceived. And what really struck me was that when Victoria becomes queen, to use a modern expression, she really hits the ground running. There doesn't seem to be any sort of hesitation. She Describe what happened sort of immediately uh, following the, the announcement that she's queen. Oh. I love the story of Victoria becoming queen. It's, it's an amazing story because the, Victoria turns 18. Disaster was day for the Duchess of Kent. The most wonderful day for King William IV. He was always determined to hold on to health until his successor became of age because he hated the Duchess of Kent. So he even said to the doctors, you know, keep me going. When she turned 18, he was too ill to come to her birthday ball, but he gave her a beautiful piano and he gave up on health. He essentially gave up on life. And you know, less than five weeks later, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lord Chamberlain came to Kensington Palace to tell Victoria that she would be queen. They arrived very early, in, uh, but the Duchess wouldn't let them in. She wouldn't let them in. Um, but eventually she had to, and she woke Victoria and told her that the, the men were downstairs for her. Victoria came down in her night nightdress, and the Duchess of Kent tried to come in with her, and Victoria said no. She said, no, you can't. I'm going in alone. And there, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lord Chamberlain knelt to her and told her she was queen of the most powerful country in the world. What's really incredible to me is Victoria's response after she's told she's queen. She thanks God, she's, she talks about her duty. And the first two things she asks for are an hour alone because she, you know, she's never had that in her life. She's been, she's been a combat pampered child. She's been to the ballet and the opera with her mother and she had beautiful clothes and, and banquets but she's never had an hour alone. And then after that, she asked to have her bed moved from her mother's room. So really, she wants her own bedroom and she's making her big signal to Mama, I don't want to see you anymore. The, the other thing which very quickly becomes apparent is that Victoria, unlike her debauched uncles, sees being queen as very much a job. It's, it's something that you do and you're serious about it. And, and when Albert later wants to have a long honeymoon, she says, no, I'm, you know, I've got responsibilities. I can't go off for four or six weeks on, on tour. And that's really new, isn't it? She's the, the first monarch to really adopt that attitude to being to being queen. Victoria is the first monarch. You're absolutely right. She, this is this is what fascinated me in particular. Complete contrast to these Hanoverian uncles who do see monarchy as just their personal playground. She's she's our first modern monarch. This is this is the, someone who sees the role of monarch as a duty. You 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 meet your people. You you sign you sign the dispatches. You you spend a lot of time with the prime minister. You are there to do a. A job of work. You are judged not by how glamorous and attractive you might look in, in a lady so and so's party, as is, as in the case of, of the previous uncles, but on how well you fulfil your duties. It's the, it's the ultimate precursor to our modern Elizabeth II, and I really, I really think this, this is kind of. And she, she does it so. She's so not only she's so young. There aren't many eighteen-year-olds who'd really like to be doing spending hours and hours signing dispatches and going to privy councils and spending time with the prime minister. She's kind of she's trying to take this incredible joy in it, an incredible, incredible joy in hard work that, that is, it is, of course, so very Victorian. Mm. I really think that if we, if we believe that constitutional monarchy is, 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 a, is a great thing, she is the, is the saviour of the modern monarchy because we've forgotten George IV, we've forgotten William IV. I think had Victoria not, not to have existed and come on the throne and been so incredibly dutiful and conscientious, we might remember slightly more about George IV and William IV because I really don't think that the country could have coped with another debauch after the death of William IV, another debauched brother. And in fact, the brother who was due to inherit after William IV was the Duke of Cumberland, who was even worse than the rest of them put together. In fact, there'd be rumours that he'd killed his valet and he was, he was desperately, desperpately hated. He was not just a debauchee, he was seen as evil as well. So the thought of him being on the, on the throne, I, I just wonder if the British people non-riotous and responsible as we are, would have we really been able to cope with it? So to me, it's almost as if Charlotte and Victoria were the saviors of the monarchy. The hope of Charlotte kept the British people going through the, through the sort of dark yeah. days of George IV and his sort of naughty, naughty brothers. And that the, the sort of reality of Victoria gave them great hope and, and allowed absolutely Britain to move forward into this new age. I mean, although she was a Regency figure, she sort of loved dancing and fashion and the court and ballet and opera. At the same time, she, she sort of epitomised this sort of hard-working, outward-looking, philanthropic, caring, this, this kind of energetic 
this energetic way of living at the Victorian age. You're no, one, you're no longer trying to show off your fashion, you're trying to show off your commitment, which mm. is so Victorian. Mm.